It's Monday morning, December 21st, 2015, in a quiet neighborhood in Rupperswil, Switzerland. A neighbor stops by the shower home, and she normally does around that time, to pick up their dog, Chili, for a walk. She rings the doorbell, and though it takes a little longer than normal for anyone to answer, she's not alarmed. Finally, Carla Shower arrives at the door, pup in hand. The neighbor is surprised because Carla is without makeup, which is uncharacteristic for her neighbor. But her concern is amplified when Carla hastily hands the dog to her through a cracked door, then quickly closes the door, not a word spoken. The neighbor was stunned by the incredibly odd behavior and instantly got the sense that Carla was afraid of something. But not knowing what may have been happening behind closed doors, she didn't want to intrude. Raising even more concern was the fact that Carl's oldest son, Dion, also had plans to meet up with some friends that morning. When he didn't show, his friends tried to contact him, but he didn't respond. Then, at around 11.30 that same morning, a call came into the fire brigade, reporting that there was smoke coming from the shower's home. Firefighters rushed to the home expecting to find a minor incident. But what they would find would terrify this small Swiss town and the entire country like no other case to date. Welcome back to Crime A to Z, where we detail cases and criminals from their very beginning until well after other reporting ends. Today, we'll be talking about the most terrifying crime case in Switzerland's recent history, notable for the cold-blooded manner in which it was carried out. We had never heard of this case, so a huge thank you to Kimberly Mercer 7107 for recommending it. We love being able to bring you cases you want to see, so if you got a case you'd like us to cover, please drop it in the comments below. So, let's get to it. Carla Schauer was a happy, positive, divorced mother of two, enjoying her life along with her longtime partner, George Mecker, who was a foster father to her two loving sons, 13-year-old son Davin and 19-year-old Dion. The younger son Davin was a kind child with a beautiful smile who was very close with his older brother Dion. Dion had lots of friends and he loved sports and nature. The family lived in the primarily German-speaking town of Rupperswil, a municipality in the canton or state of Argau in Switzerland. With a population of under 5,000 people, it was a small community where crime was practically non-existent. That was until December of 2015. Firefighters were called that morning to the shower home with reports that neighbors saw smoke coming from the home. Expecting to battle a minor fire then be on their way, the firefighters soon found that this was neither a small fire nor a simple scenario. In the home, they quickly discovered four badly burned bodies. All four were bound. And while their bodies were badly burned by the fire, they were quickly able to discern that these four victims were not just victims of the fire, but of murder. All four had their throats slashed before the fire began. The bodies being carried out of the home were those of Carla, Davin and Dion, and Dion's 21-year-old girlfriend, Simona Fass. The only person not at the home at the time of the fire was Carla's partner, George, who had left earlier that morning for work. With the town being so small, the news spread like wildfire. Everyone was in shock. How could four of their own be murdered in broad daylight in their sleepy town? With no one apprehended, residents, justifiably, began to feel anxious and unsafe in their homes. Doors that would normally remain unlocked were suddenly locked. With the killings being the largest and most notable crime anyone in the region had ever seen, all hands were immediately on deck. A special, unprecedented 40-member commission was formed to work around the clock, along with 100 other officers involved with the investigation. Despite the killer's effort to destroy any evidence by setting the home on fire, investigators were able to gather DNA and fingerprint evidence from the scene almost immediately. They compared it to their criminal database, but no matches. So one of their first orders of business was to question the closest relatives to the family, they questioned Carla's partner, George Mecker, George's ex-wife, their son, only known as R.S., the father of Davin and Dion, the father's new wife, and Carla's parents. All volunteered both their fingerprints and DNA, and all were cleared. 
Next, they collected DNA from all the neighbors. No hits. So, they focused in on the person who is most commonly the culprit in such cases, the spouse or partner. In this case, George Mecker. Particularly since he was the only person not at home at the time of the murders. But George was not aware he was under suspicion. Police were covertly monitoring his mobile and landline calls, and intercepting his emails, texts, and online activity, around the clock. All of his phone conversations were transcribed, and a secret GPS transmitter was placed on his car, so they knew his whereabouts at all times. Nothing was private. Meanwhile, police were still gathering witness statements and receiving tips from the public. But, in general, they were at a loss. They were struggling to identify a motive. The family didn't have any financial struggles. They had no known disputes and no known enemies. Then, it was soon discovered that Carla had made two large withdrawals from two separate banks around 9.50 a.m., just before she was murdered. Both banks provided surveillance footage of Carla's transactions. They showed Carla seemingly scared, tense, and in a rush. Police now had a motive. Money. So, they continued exploring any and every possible avenue they could to try to filter out any potential suspects. They probed mobile phone antenna activity from the area. But with nearly 30,000 mobile phones logged into the radio mast around the crime scene on the morning of the crime, it didn't help them isolate any perpetrators. They even had the case featured on a popular German television program that aims to solve crimes, similar to unsolved mysteries in the US. The show featured those surveillance photos of Carla at the banks in hopes that someone might have information that would help. Police even informed the International Criminal Police Organization, or Interpol, of the crime to solicit worldwide police cooperation. And then on February 16th, they had their first press conference. They offered a reward of 100,000 Swiss francs, equivalent to about 108,000 US dollars, for any information leading to the capture of the killer or killers. This was the largest reward offered in Swiss criminal history, reflecting the urgency and fear of catching the killer. The press conference led to an additional 250 leads, 110 people questioned, and still no viable suspects. Investigations were proving incredibly difficult since there was seemingly no relation between the victims and the perpetrator. So, despite having fingerprints and DNA, the press conference, being featured on the unsolved television program, hundreds of tips and leads from the public, and copious amounts of mobile and other data, they were no closer to a viable suspect. Until Five months into the investigation, authorities reached out to internet giant Google who obtained all IP addresses of computers in the vicinity who had searched for information about the family during the time period leading up to the murders. They got a hit. Only one person emerged. They were able to trace that IP address to a youth soccer coach slash manager that lived in the region. He had searched the victims' names, their whereabouts, and other various details about the family on multiple occasions. His name was Thomas Nick. Thomas Nick was a 33-year-old, unmarried, local resident who lived with his mother and two dogs and had no previous convictions. He appeared to be an average, law-abiding citizen, appearing perfectly normal to the people who knew him. But most noted that they didn't really know much about his personal life as he typically kept to himself, other than working as a manager for two local youth soccer clubs, called football, in Switzerland. He acted as manager, but would help train the teams if there were ever staff shortages. The apartment he shared with his mother was located just 500 meters or about a quarter mile from the showers. Armed with a potential suspect, the police checked the mobile antenna records they had obtained previously and found that Nick's cell phone appeared on it prominently. From his signals, they learned that he would typically walk his dogs each day on a route that passed the victim's home. But not on the day of the murder. On that morning, there were no signal hits on his phone whatsoever, unlike all previous days. But with no criminal record and no hard evidence against him, police could not arrest him. So, they went to Plan B. On May 11, 2016, police got word that Nick was headed to the city of Ara, a 10-minute drive from Rupperswil. Cleverly posing as traffic control, they sent up a traffic checkpoint between Rohr and Rupperswil, where Nick was likely to pass on his way to Ara. It worked. They asked him to take a breathalyzer test, and once obtained, immediately sent the two to the lab for DNA testing. They compared his DNA to the DNA obtained at the crime scene. It was a match. The following morning, 
just before 9 a.m. as Nick was sipping his coffee and working on his laptop at a Starbucks in Aral. Ten officers hid behind buildings nearby. After he settled in, they moved in and arrested him. They placed a black cap over his head so that Nick could not see where he was being taken and no one could see who was being taken away. Police promptly held another press conference to allay the public's intense fear. There, the chief public prosecutor announced, The time of uncertainty is over. The perpetrator is caught. When they arrested Nick, he was carrying a backpack containing an old Swiss Army pistol, a knife, fire accelerant, rope, zip ties to be used as handcuffs, duct tape, gloves, and a sex toy. All were neatly packed and ready to be used. More on that in a moment. Once arrested, to police's surprise, Nick began to promptly and comprehensively confess to the crime, detailing both how and why it happened. He acknowledged that he had been stalking Carla's 13-year-old son, Devin, for quite some time before the murders. And while Nick was at the station confessing, police were simultaneously raiding his apartment. There, in addition to searches on the family, they'd also find on his computer over a thousand videos and over 10,000 explicit photos of young boys. They also found a notebook that listed the names of 11 boys aged 11 to 14, all of whom closely resembled Davin. And between the evidence gathered and Nick's in-depth confession, police were able to piece together the increasingly horrifying series of events. Only marginally employed and primarily living off of his mother, Nick had originally dreamed of making big money by blackmailing people, then murdering them after he got the money. Then, around that time, while walking his dogs along his regular route one morning, Nick spotted Davin going about his normal day and immediately became fixated on him. As time went on, he became obsessed with the young boy and began planning a way to work Davin into his plan. So he adjusted his blackmail scheme into one that also satisfied his depraved desires. He spent months meticulously planning the murders, trying to figure out a way to get to the sun. And once he finalized it, he wrote it down in the same book that police had found the other young boy's names in. It was Nick's official M.O. And it read, The scenario would be the same. A letter from the school, a robbery, the rape of a minor, murder, and arson. So he began stalking the family, learning their routine, falsifying ID and letters, and putting his plan into action. Then, at 7.15 a.m. on the morning of December 21, 2015, after having already changed his cell phone to airplane mode to prevent it from being tracked, Nick patiently waited for Carla's partner, George, to leave for work. Then, when he was sure Carla and the kids were alone, he approached the home and rang the doorbell. When Carla answered, he told her that he was a psychologist from Davin's school, and that young Davin may have been involved in an incident with another student at school. He presented a fake letter and school ID to trick Carla into letting him inside to discuss the matter. Carla was concerned about her son and had also seen Nick around town. So she invited him in and made him some coffee. Nick then brandished his weapons and ordered Carla to awaken everyone in the house and assemble them into one room. Then with the gun to Davin's head, Nick forced Carla to bind the three children's hands with the zip ties he brought with him. Then he forced Carla to pull up her laptop and show him how much money she had in her accounts, so he would know how much he could force her to withdraw. At 9.30 a.m., over two hours after Nick had invaded their home, the neighbor arrived for the dog. Frazzled, Carla quickly thrust the dog onto the neighbor through the barely opened door, then quickly closed it. Nick then instructed Carla to go get the money from two banks and took a picture of her with his cell phone before she left. He told her that he was sending the picture to his partner, who was supposedly waiting for her by the bank. There was no partner. He also threatened to murder her children if she did not cooperate. Carla left and made a withdrawal at the first bank's ATM around 9.50. Then she drove to a second bank in a different area of town and made an in-person withdrawal. In total, she withdrew the equivalent of around 10,000 Swiss francs or a little more than 10,000 US dollars. When she returned to the house at 10.30 a.m., she was also gagged and tied up by Nick. And then, the unthinkable. Nick proceeded to rape young Gavin in front of his mother and family. He documented the abuse by videoing it with his cell phone camera. Then, when he was done, he slashed each of their throats, 
one by one. He murdered 19-year-old Dion first since he had managed to free himself from the zip ties. With each poor soul helplessly and frantically forced to watch each person before them be murdered until he got to them. He then doused their bodies in the furniture with accelerant, set the home on fire in an attempt to burn away any of his fingerprints and evidence, then left unnoticed. The same day, he transferred all the photos and videos he'd taken onto his laptop, where he would continue to view them over the coming months, the last time of which was May 6, six days before he was arrested. After the murders, Nick returned to his home, showered, took his dogs for a walk with his mother, and then later spent the evening with friends at a casino for dinner. He later used the money he stole to purchase designer clothes and a ski trip holiday for his mother and himself. And back to that backpack full of murder supplies. Remember Nick's notebook that police found that contained the names of 11 other young boys? Well, for each of those boys, Nick had researched and noted details for each of them, including their names, photos, the schools they went to, and numerous other details about each of their lives. And of those 11 boys, Nick had already begun extensively stalking two of them, along with their families, and had even already made contact with them. One of them lived in the canton of Bern, and the other in the canton of Solothurn, located in North Switzerland. And on May 11, the day before he was arrested, Nick actually visited Solothurn. And with him, he had his backpack of murder supplies, forged letters from the local school, and business cards showing that he was that school psychologist. He had thoroughly researched the new family, the son's school schedule, and the local bank opening times. In his notebook, he'd written, Tuesday, 7.40 a.m., everyone at home, awake. For unknown reasons, Nick did not go through with any plans that day and drove home. Five months after Nick's arrest, George Metger received a letter from the public prosecutor's office titled, Dismissal Order. It identified the intense suspicion and surveillance he was under beginning early on in the investigation. He was not aware of the surveillance until that moment. Thomas Mick's trial began on March 13, 2018, two years after his arrest. He pleaded guilty to all charges. He was found mentally stable by a psychiatrist, so he was not able to plead insanity. The notoriety of this case was unprecedented in Switzerland. The media coverage was non-stop and nearly everyone aware of the case was disgusted and ashamed that someone from their country could carry out such an evil act. During the trial, Nick shared with the judge how he found Carla to be kind and charming and that he liked her. The judge asked him why he decided to go through with his plan and not show her any mercy if that's how he felt. He responded, I was like in a bubble. I would have loved to stay in this house for hours without deciding what to do next. The whole responsibility was mine. The only thing I could do was kill. But during later testimony, he was asked whether he felt he was in a murderous frenzy, killing without thinking. He stated he was not, indicating that he was in no such bubble. Anyone who is not in a murderous frenzy and is able to continue carrying out the heinous and controlled act of murdering four innocent people, one after the other, while the family is screaming and Carla pleading for her children's lives is as disturbing as they come. And how do you defend that? Shockingly, Nick's public defender, Renette Sen, tasked with the unenviable job of representing Thomas Nick, went with the incomprehensible strategy of blaming the victims. She claimed, in part, that the victims were complicit in the crime and shared some of the blame, stating, The mother just let the perpetrator into the apartment. The mother didn't show anything when a neighbor picked up the dog. The mother didn't show anything when picking up the money. She added, Thomas Nick did not cause the victims more pain than was necessary for a killing. He did not kill for pleasure. The public did not take well to the public defender's strategy. In court, Nick revealed that while he was planning each of the details of the crimes, they were so extreme, seemed so unimaginable, that he was never once afraid that he'd actually carry them out. He didn't think he'd ever compromise his reputation or disappoint his mother. He couldn't imagine her ever learning how disturbed he was. It was also found that he was so determined to not disappoint her that he never divulged to her that he dropped out of college and instead led her to believe that he had graduated with a Bachelor of Science degree. The judge marveled at how much easier it was for Nick to murder four people than it was for him to tell his mother that he didn't have a degree. Divulging to his mother that he didn't have a degree brought Nick to tears in court. The murders did not.
Thomas Nick was convicted on all charges including several counts of murder, extortion, hostage-taking, sexual assault, sexual acts with a child, child pornography, arson, and numerous other charges. Next came the sentencing. Switzerland's sentencing structure is based on whether it's believed that a person can be rehabilitated or not via therapy. The prosecution requested that Nick be sentenced to the highest level sentence of life imprisonment, which in Switzerland is reserved for criminals they deem untreatable by therapy. Anyone sentenced to life imprisonment can only be released if new scientific information makes therapy possible or if old age or sickness resulted in an accused no longer posing a risk to society. And that sentence can only be handed down if two independent psychiatrists diagnose the criminal as untreatable. But unfortunately, the two psychiatrists who examined Nick could not say with 100% certainty that Nick was untreatable. So Nick Thomas was sentenced to Switzerland's middle-level prison sentence, indeterminate incarceration, which essentially means he must serve at least 20 years behind bars, after which he will only be eligible for parole if strict conditions are met. On December 21st, 2015, George Mecker lost the love of his life, along with his two foster sons, in one fell swoop. He recorded that loss and their lives in a book he wrote called For Immer, which means forever in English. And from Carla's father, regarding the loss, he stated, It's the first thought for me, my wife, and my son when we wake up in the morning. The pain is unbearable. Nick Thomas is currently serving out his sentence at Poshwies Prison in Regensdorf, Switzerland. He undergoes therapy and was ordered to pay 700,000 Swiss francs, the relatives of the victims, as well as 525,000 Swiss francs of court costs. As far as accommodations, Switzerland has some of the best-ranked prison facilities for their inmates in the world, ranking within the top 10. While most cells are not luxurious, depending on the prison, they are typically more akin to dorm or hotel rooms, than what we consider prison cells in the U.S. On one popular U.S. forum, someone posted, What crime do I need to commit to get sent to one of these? The purpose of these accommodations is to treat prisoners humanely and with dignity on their path to rehabilitation. Nick has been a model prisoner, but his good behavior is not expected to play a factor in his release since he was a master at faking his entire life prior to the murders. So good behavior in prison isn't expected to be an accomplishment for him, nor a result of any therapy. All of Mick's prison calls are to his mother, who is also the only person who visits him. Mick says he plans to study economics while in prison, then went out to take care of his mother and dogs and become reacclimated into society. This case was a lot. We hope we did justice to the Sweet Shower family. As parents with their own children, we have no sympathy for Thomas Nick and can only hope any parole hearings he faces in the future are denied. Some pondered why Carla did not go for help when she went to get the money from the ATMs. And early on in the investigation, some even wondered whether she was involved. We can only speculate the extent that she and her children were threatened, and the sheer terror she endured while she was out. But we feel deep within our hearts that she most certainly did whatever she felt and was led to believe would save those children back at the home. Now your turn. Did this case impact you like it did us? Do you think Thomas Nick should have been given the opportunity to be rehabilitated? And do you think rehabilitation is even possible for him? Please share your thoughts in the comments. And if you like how we presented the case or want to see more videos like this one, please be sure to hit like and definitely hit subscribe so you never miss a single video.